Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the first event in this term's alumni lecture series. It's lovely to see that so many of you have joined us today. My name is Sophie Schermacher, and I'm the Alumni Relations Officer at Green Templeton. Um, before we start, I've just got one or two bits of housekeeping to run through. Um, please note that the event will be recorded, so you'll be able to watch again at your leisure. Uh, you'll all be muted during the event, but we will be holding a Q&A session at the end of Jotty's talk. But we do have quite a number of pre-submitted questions, so I'm afraid we can't guarantee that we'll be able to answer everyone's questions, but we will, be do, we will do our best. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Jotty Chopra. Jotty is an alumna of Green Templeton, starting her executive MBA in 2015, and is currently Chief People, Inclusion and Sustainability, Sustainability Officer at MGM Resorts International. Jotty also sits on the board of Schneider, a provider of transportation and logistics, as well as being a member of the board of advisors for Toyota North America. Jotty's lecture today will be on the topic, integrating diversity and inclusion into corporate strategies, a case study of MGM Resorts International. Over to you, Jotty. Thank you very much, Sophie. A very good afternoon or good morning to those that are patching in from overseas. I'm uh, dialed in from Las Vegas, Nevada, so I'm on Pacific time in the US where it's a little after seven in the morning, uh, but it's wonderful to be with all of you. And let me extend um, a very warm welcome also to Sir Michael Dixon, our new principal, and congratulations on your appointment. I very much look forward to meeting with you and also to our former principal, Denise Lively. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to uh, connect with Green Templeton, which was a very special place and home for me when I was away from home doing my executive MBA at Said. Um, what I thought I would do today is unpack and perhaps demystify a little bit the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. And so the first part of my presentation will focus on what have been some of the prevailing uh, themes, trends, headwinds uh, on this topic. And so I'll begin with a bit of a macro outlook. And then what I thought I would do is explore some of the practical dimensions of this topic uh, by sharing with you how from the perspective of MGM, which is where I work, we've taken this sort of topic and actually begun to put it into practice through various strategies. And so I'll be sharing with you um, some real um, slides that we use in our workplace uh, that'll give you a sense of how you actually put this into practice and into action from within the walls of an organization. So with that, I'd, I'll ask Jamie to bring up our presentation so we can get started. So if we head over to slide two, I'd like to begin with um, firstly, just talking about the talent landscape and what has been happening um, in the world around us, particularly over the, over the last decade. Uh, there are a number of sources um, for the research and the themes that I've outlined here. And I'd like to spend a few minutes on this because I think it's important context for the topic and um, for the discussion ahead. Um, one of the big shifts that we've seen from a talent or a people perspective has been really in the way that uh, people are being employed and are engaging in the workforce. And so you've seen a rise of what we call contingent workers, agile staffing, and uh, companies and organizations having much more dynamic work environments. And so this has, in effect, created what we call the gig economy which is where you sometimes have people working as contractors, consultants, as an example, who may have multiple jobs or working on multiple projects, um, as an example. The second important shift has been what we call the rise of digital natives. Um, and so for the first time in history, you have now four generations in the workforce. But what's important is their expectations and the contracts that they have and the expectations with their employers. Um, and um, because we have been pre-pandemic in a fairly competitive tight labor market in, in many of the major economies, uh, what's given rise um, has been the expectations of employees or contractors or consultants, if you will, 
with their respective employers. And so this notion of the candidate experience is one of great significance, which is what is it people expect when they come to work, irrespective of where they work. Um, and so that might take the form of benefits, it might take the form of um, uh, the work environment, it might take the form of cultural expectations, uh, but that's been a, a very significant change. Technology has also been a, a force. And so um, uh, the way people work, the types of jobs, while we've seen certain types of jobs go away, technology um, and the pro proliferation of new technologies and apps and so many other things, uh, whether it's hardware, software, uh, whether it is um, uh, web design, um, web architecture as examples, um, uh, there, there's been a rise in so many different and new types of jobs, which then demands new sets of skills and capabilities. And so you have this constantly dynamic and very fast changing environment, which leads to the uh, sort of need, if you will, of skilling and reskilling, even within organizations and companies. And then we've seen the, the, the rise of diversity in inclusion, uh, both in the workforce and in the workplace. I'll talk about this in more detail, but there's been no doubt that it has been fueled by a surge of advocacy, public movements, litigation, legislation, regulation. And so I'll, I'll be diving into that uh, a little bit more. Uh, we've seen, and particularly with the onset of the, and during the duration of the pandemic, uh, remote working, working from home, taken to a completely new level. If I take my own company, MGM, we are a hotel resorts property-based company. We operate 29 locations. We had a workforce of over 80,000 people, but we're in the hotel business, which means we have physical properties. So you need people on site and on staff. We've had to move in many cases to um, where people are working um, completely remote for certain functions. We've moved people out of corporate parks and offices and um, ha had to very quickly adjust to remote, remote working. And um, this has led to um, different types of engagements with your employees. So how your employees engage with you, how you communicate to your employees, how you set boundaries between work-life balance, the integration of work into life, the people working from home at the same time they're having to deal with homeschooling. So all kinds of new dynamics have been introduced, particularly in the last 12 to 14 months. And so a lot of companies and organizations are really looking at remote working, working from home, and this notion of uh, work-life balance. Uh, we've had a global crisis, we've had systemic disruptions, and so this has put a lot of emphasis on learning and development teams within organizations around areas like learning agility and change and endurance. And the last has been really immigration policies, um, and um, you know, we have impacts from Brexit, for example, in the US we've had immigration reforms. And what this has led to has also been the availability of talent pools and talent flows. So if I look at the US, for example, when you start imposing visa restrictions, um, abilities with um, people coming in from certain countries that might have certain types of skill sets, all of a sudden um, the dynamic changes and the availability of labor pools begin to change. So companies have had to sort of relook at this and rethink this, and it has had a, an impact on uh, workforce hiring. So that's a quick overview of the talent landscape and what's been happening in the broader market. If we go to the next slide, Jamie, let me segue to um, um, what's happening more specifically in and around the diversity inclusion landscape and what have been some um, uh, changes there. So if we go to slide three, I'll just wait for a minute for that to come up. I'm gonna talk about three uh, prevailing um, trends. Uh, one centers around people and community. Um, the, second centers, uh, the second centers really around the social movements and the rise of uh, public advocacy on the topic. And the third has to do with regulation and legislation. But let's first start with people and community and some of the dynamics around that. Um, employers today have been really competing for qualified skilled talent 
in addition to the war for customers, engagement and experience really are very high value drivers. So what you're seeing is companies and organizations trying to differentiate themselves through the value proposition that they offer their employees. Um, and I've laid out here on the right side, what have been some of the contributing factors that have led to the dynamics around the landscape. I mentioned earlier, you have four generations today in the labor market, their engagement, the way they work, their expectations with their employers is quite different. If you're looking at millennials versus baby boomers, as an example, um, you have emerging markets, uh, changing customer demands. Uh, population dynamics. If you look at markets like Japan, for example, which is one of the fastest aging populations, you contrast that to a market like India, which has one of the youngest populations in the world. Um, supply and delivery of goods and services, how you market to those customers is, is changing. And that's led to the rise of what we call multiculturalism. You have global communities, um, uh, virtual forums, uh, public movements. Uh, the other important factor has been uh, the rise of what we call ESG, environmental, social, and governance. Um, ESG is um, um, on the on on the rise and and surging. And um, what what's important, I think, for all of you to be aware of, is that um, unlike any other time, probably uh, in the past. This wind is being fueled by institutional investors and shareholders. Um, you know, some of it stems from heightened social awareness and consciousness. Some of it is stemming from a lot of research that has been done in the space to really um, encourage companies to be much more socially conscious. And you're seeing it in the form of companies like BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, Fidelity, which are some of the largest institutional shareholders in the world, actually setting down um, uh, contractual requirements um, for companies in which they invest. It might be the composition of boards and making sure that every board of a public company in which they invest has at least a woman or diversity as a simple example. And so this is changing the way organizations and companies actually look at their workforce, their diversity policies, the composition of their board. And this is something that is, um, I think, going to continue to um, increase in focus and attention. And uh, this is resulting in a lot of companies looking within their four walls and saying, what are the practices, policies, processes, mm -hmm measures that we have to have in order to meet these requirements by our institutional shareholders. If you go to the next slide, let me segue to um, some of the social movements. What we're seeing is um, in the last decade, and, and particularly with the rise of <clears throat> social media, increasing demands through public advocacy, um, whether it's customers, whether it's the public writ, writ large or its uh, shareholders, around holding companies and organizations accountable in this area. And so I, I listed on the, on the right side uh, just some examples uh, in recent um, years. But we've had the LGBTQ plus movement. Uh, we've had issues around gun violence and safety. More recently in the US, uh, police brutality in the wake of certain killings, so the rise of social justice, Black Lives Matter last year, immigration, climate change. And what's happened is with the rise of these movements in the form of public advocacy and calls for reform and changes, a lot of companies, CEOs, boards, management teams are being increasingly called upon to issue public responses, statements um, by their companies in addition to CEOs. So it's another important uh, prevailing um, theme here. If you go to the next slide, um, let me turn to the topic of legislation and regulation, which has really been on the rise, uh, particularly over the last two decades. Um, and you'll see as the slide comes up here, um, there've been some, fairly landmark moments. Um, I'll just wait for the slide to catch up so that, so that you can see it. 
recruitment. Um, we've had, for example, in the UK, mandatory gender pay gap reporting, which you're all familiar with. Um, this was introduced in 2017 and, uh, you know, essentially called for companies that had more than 250 employees to, on an annual basis, report on uh, their gender data, gender pay gap reporting. Um, and I think this is a trend or a theme that is certainly going to continue. And I would expect to see that extended to diversity. And it's quite possible that other countries will begin to introduce this on a mandatory basis. I've included here some other legislation just to give you a sense of the scope and nature of legislation that's occurred. And as I mentioned, these are some of the landmark um, acts that have uh, been instituted. But what has been the result has been that employers, companies, organizations have to pay attention, they have to report, they have to fulfill these requirements. And so it's led to a lot of internal introspection and dealing with um, how do we respond? What are the policies, systems, processes, measurement and reporting mechanisms that we have to have in place? in order to uh, meet these requirements. So this has been, I think, a very significant uh, a wind, if you will, that has led to um, a lot of companies paying attention and realizing that diversity and inclusion is a very important facet of how we do business and engage uh, in the marketplace and with regulators and legislators. So let me now um, turn to one other important aspect. And if we go to the next slide, Jamie, and that is the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Hopefully everyone is uh, familiar with these, but um, um, the UN uh, launched uh, these in 2015. Um, this is a set of 17 goals that were established by the United Nations in close consultation for the very first time with the private sector. And the way to think about this is this is a blueprint for the world. These are 17 goals, um, and underneath each of these goals are very specific milestones for companies and organizations to adhere to, to really help drive globally um, environmental sustainability, social impact, and the welfare of people around the world. What you're starting to see as another trend is a lot of companies and organizations begin to align their work in diversity, inclusion, sustainability, environmental policies, to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I've outlined here as an example and as an illustration of how we at MGM look at the goals. We've selected 10 of them. And then particularly on the diversity and inclusion front, you'll see on the far right, these are the three sustainable development goals that we are particularly aligning our diversity strategy with. And so this is an example of how we are tackling this, but I think this is important for all of you to be aware of and just the thinking around how institutions are engaging with the sustainable development goals and um, translating it into action. Uh, if we go to the next slide, let me now turn to a corporate illustration. And I've really set this up as a case study um, in terms of how an organization, and in, in this case, MGM Resorts, where I work and I serve as Chief Diversity, Inclusion and Sustainability Officer, have taken sort of this macro environment and translated it into um, a concrete set of corporate strategies and efforts. So I'm gonna now sort of bridge and give you um, the, the example of the case study, if you will, so you could see how do you bring this to life. But here, what you see is our diversity frame and inclusion framework for our company. Uh, you see at the top, um, going left to right, four pillars. The first two, invest in people and inclusion, inclusive culture, are internal. The second two, um, on the right, business customer engagement, supply diversity, and the marketplace one, are external. So we're thinking about diversity and inclusion both from an internal dimension as well as from an external dimension. And what you see articulated on the bottom half of the slide are our four long-term goals. Most companies are setting up long-term goals um, in and around diversity and inclusion. And what's important is that you develop goals and then publicly state them and put into practice appropriate measurement policies um, so that you can track your progress or, or lack of um, against the goals. 
you go to the next slide, um, terminology and language is very important. And I think um, it's, it's important for every organization to be very precise and very clear about what is it you mean when you say these words, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. And I've listed here the four most important terms. And again, this is from an MGM perspective, um, how we think about diversity, how we have chosen to diverse, uh, define inclusion, equity, and belonging. Um, and it's, it's a way of level, level setting the organization and getting your whole workforce aligned around these concepts, which are not easy. And so this is how we think about um, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. We're a very complicated business. We're in gaming, casinos, hotels, resorts, entertainment, retail, online and sports betting. Um, we're we're, we're um, looking to expand our business activities in Japan. We have properties in Macau in addition to many locations around the US. It's a very complicated business and this is a very complicated topic to overlay. So being clear about how you um, uh, define and um, uh, engage with your workforce around these areas is particularly important. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, how you measure is also very important. Um, and I know that the, there was a question that came in in terms of measurement. Uh, and what I would say as a headline is it's important to have both quantitative and qualitative measures. And so again, I've outlined here how we look at our measures um, from a diversity and inclusion perspective. We're looking at it from a demographics perspective. So you might look at composition of your workforce by race, by gender, but you might also look at things like succession benches, your promotion rates, your new hire rates. You might look at it in terms of uh, marketplace recognition. Uh, you might look at it from a customer perspective, um, from an engagement perspective, looking at your internal surveys and scores. So this is our measurement model and framework. And as you see, it's articulated both quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna segue into a little bit more broadly um, around um, people. I began this presentation on the topic of people and talent. And um, irrespective of whether you're a public sector uh, entity or a private sector entity, uh, I think it's really important that work in and around diversity and inclusion is anchored in a broader set of people or talent strategies. Uh, one of my areas of responsibility for our corporation is overseeing human resources. And so as part of that, what my team and I have been very focused on is how do we integrate diversity and inclusion into our broader HR, talent, and people practices? And so what you see articulated here is how we've done that. So we framed out our corporate vision uh, and, and mission, if you will, which is in the case of MGM to entertain the human race. Uh, uh, but also we've woven into our company mission and vision um, uh, components of um, diversity inclusion and aligned our human resources mission as you see laid out here um, around sort of our aspirations for our people and our talent. If we go to the next slide, I've taken it down a little bit um, at a deeper level and begun to frame out what we call our people philosophy. We are in the people business. Um, at the moment, we're probably about 52,000 strong in terms of the workforce, uh, but we serve um, millions of customers around the world through our 29 locations. And we are a service industry. And so people are at the heart of everything we do. And so we felt it very important as part of our diversity and inclusion work to have a clearly articulated framework that spells out what is our people philosophy, what is our people strategy, and what is it that we want to stand for. And the other important point I want to make here is I spent a lot of time with our chief financial officer and his team because one of the things that's very important is, is this notion of human capital on par with financial capital. We do a very good job in terms of looking at financial data and disclosures, looking at our balance sheet, our income statements. And the discipline that I'm trying to build within the walls of our company 
is alongside that also thinking about your human capital from a data perspective. And so it's a muscle one has to build and it's a discipline. Uh, but the notion here is really thinking about human capital with an equal emphasis as much as we do on our financial capital. If we go to the next slide, uh, what I've articulated here are really the four cornerstones of our people's strategy. So talent development, succession planning, diversity and inclusion, and the employee experience and culture are very much at the heart of this framework. And for us, it's really about the connectivity of individual purpose to organizational impact. And our belief fundamentally that the more engaged your workforce is, the greater the impact and in a positive way that they're going to have on the organization. But to my earlier point around having multiple generations in the workforce, uh, we have that at MGM. We have people at our company that have been 30, 40 years at our company. And we have people that have just joined in the last few weeks. And so this notion of adding meaning to work and having a very engaged workforce is a really important concept. And that's also very much at the heart of our people's strategy. Go to the next slide. Uh, as I begin to wind down uh, the presentation, um, I, I just leave you with sort of um, a couple of uh, pieces of work around um, people. Uh, the first is a set of people principles. Um, with our leadership team together and with our CEO, we really spent time thinking about what is it we want to stand for when it comes to people? What is the commitment that we want to make to our people? And how are we going to really embed a core set of guiding principles around people? And so what you see articulated here are 10 guiding principles for us, for our company, that we have asked our management and our leadership team to really own and to drive throughout the organization in terms of people principles. And so, um, you know, it includes things like igniting a spark and passion to um, really encouraging decisive, agile and courageous leadership to advancing a culture of high performance and meritocracy. But this is something that we've taken to heart and that we're really trying to embed as a key cornerstone of our culture. And the last uh, piece I'll leave you with is our talent framework. And again, um, uh, as we go to the next slide, uh, you, you'll see here this model that we've designed. And the, the, the intent here is to have a very holistic view of your people and your talent from an organizational construct perspective. And it's a cycle and it's a circle and it's built this way very purposefully and de deliberately and it's intended to be very holistic and very integrated. But you might begin with talent acquisition, which is how you go about hiring people, but then it bridges into how do you grow and develop your people? How do you onboard them? What kind of performance measurement do you have? How do you manage your talent and build succession ventures? How do you um, have feedback and assessment? Um, what are your measures? Uh, how do you integrate that, as I demonstrated earlier, into work around ESG or social impact and sustainability? And the intention here is to tie all of this work to your core values. So you see our values articulated here, excellence, inclusion, integrity, and teamwork. But it's also important that this be anchored in your business model and in your corporate strategy. And I'm very proud of the fact that um, our CEO at MGM, uh, when he rolled out his corporate strategy a few months ago, one of the four pillars of the corporate strategy is people. And so um, you know, we are integrated and very deeply embedded in both our corporate strategy as well as our organizational policies and um, people practices. So I know I've covered a lot in a rather short period of time, but I wanted to make sure that we do allow lots of time for discussion and, and, and Q&A. And uh, with that, I think we can take the presentation down and uh, segue into the question and answer portion. Just unmute. Thank you so much, Jotty. That was absolutely fascinating. And yeah, an incredibly complicated organization to, to sort of fit all these strategies into. Uh, we have had some great questions already. Um, one is how important is neurodiversity in a corporate DNI strategy? And how do we help ensure neuro neurodiversity is understood and appreciated in the same way that other characteristics are becoming? 
Thank you for the question. And it's a very, very important question. And I, I, I think it's absolutely vital that neurodiversity is considered and incorporated into um, diversity inclusion policies and practices. And for those who may not be familiar with the notion or the term, neurodiversity really refers to human brain variations. And it really relates to aspects of learning, cognitive abilities, attention, social or other mental functioning. Um, so if you think about, for example, um, uh, Asperger's, autism, other forms of um, uh, different modalities that people have, uh, this is really about how they engage in the workforce and the workplace, how they learn, how they um, have social interactions. I've been a big advocate of, of incorporating um, uh, cognitive diversity and different dimensions of diversity. And um, I tend to be a very progressive leader um, and have, have long advocated that we need to think about diversity and inclusion through a much broader frame of reference, far beyond just gender, race, sexual orientation, military or veteran status as examples, and, and really broaden that lens. There's some terrific work that's been done in this area by the Center for Talent Innovation, Sylvia Ann Hewlett, who you may know, um, uh, the British researcher and economist, um, an author has done some really terrific work in this area. But I think it's a very important aspect. I think, I think the way um, you have to really begin to tackle this is starting with education, starting with making sure that um, leaders and managers of people within the company understand neurodiversity and um, really have um, alternative response mechanisms and um, uh, are equipped and educated to be able to support this area. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another interesting question we have here, where have you seen DNI strategy done badly and what has been the most common and the most preventable error in approach? Yeah, so an example of where I've seen it done badly is when, uh, an organization or a company will say, oh, we've got to sort of tackle diversity and inclusion. Let's set some targets. Let's go out and hire more uh, diverse people, whether that's women or uh, people of color, um, set quotas and targets, and in a very short period of time, go out and try and hire as many women or people of color to fill spots to meet these targets so that they can then say, um, here's what we've done to advance diversity and inclusion. That has been, I think, one of the areas where I think organizations um, that have tackled that um, type of approach um, have failed because it's not just about hiring people um, and it's, it's very much about how do you onboard, how do you integrate, how do you assimilate, how do you ensure the success of diverse talent. And to do that, you've really got to understand your culture. You've got to understand what are the success factors, but also what are the barriers to progression or advancement. And so that's an example of something that I have seen um, through the course of my career that just simply does not work. You have to have a holistic approach. You have to understand your culture, the history, what's worked, what hasn't. Uh, and you have to have a much more comprehensive approach than just sort of setting targets, numbers, hiring. Um, another one, does your work explicitly tackle institutional racism? Yeah, this is a really important topic. Um, and I'll give you sort of a, a, a very uh, concrete example from our time at um, uh, MGM. In the, in, the, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement last year, one of the things that we did was um, we spent time doing a lot of outreach to colleagues and we created a forum called Courageous Conversations where we brought colleagues together actually with our CEO and members of our board and really encouraged um, open forum dialogue and discussion. And uh, in the wake of that, um, uh, people did speak out uh, against barriers that they had encountered in the past, um, some of the historical issues uh, that have been experienced. And um, now that we understand that better, we're very committed to addressing that. And so, I think in order to tackle institutional racism, you have to go deep, you have to understand what has led to it, what are the dynamics, how does it manifest itself, what have been the root causes of it, 
And then you can develop um, interventions and strategies to eliminate, eradicate, and to take it out and to root it out, essentially. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Denise Eversley. Hi, Denise. Uh, she says, thanks to Jyoti for an impressive and inspirational talk. Have you ever been in the position whereby there's a clash between the diversity and inclusion objectives and other strategic objectives of the corporation? And if so, how have you handled this? Hello, Denise. Lovely to hear from you, from you and uh, happy new year. And thank you for the question. So the, the answer is, is yes. Um, um, for, from a diversity and inclusion leadership perspective, um, you can set goals, you can set um, the best strategic plan. And there are times where there will be interruptions, where there will be um, things that come up um, that lead to change. Um, what I've experienced in my career have been things like, for example, regime change, um, where you um, come in, you put a plan together with a leadership team, and then there's a reorganization, and there's a change at the top of the house, and a new CEO might come in who has a diff very different point of view, or who may not be as committed as the prior CEO or leadership team to advancing the agenda, and you're forced to change course or to pivot in some ways. Another example is resources. Um, it takes resources to affect a successful uh, diversity and inclusion practice. You have to hire qualified people. You have to have policies and practices. You have to have programs. You have to have community engagement. You need funding. And there have been times where I've been in organizations where funding has been cut or pulled because the company or the organization is going through a crisis or dealing with um, um, other issues that have led to budget cuts. So there are many factors that actually um, can derail or lead to changes in a course or in a plan of action that are external. And so I think what's important is calibrating, refining, but trying to stay on track as best as you can, um, uh, despite the circumstances. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Bruni Conte. Hi, Bruni. Uh, he says, hi, Jati, thank you for the lecture. How do you ensure in the everyday business, I mean, in practical endeavors, that the people in the margins have access to leadership throughout MGM? Yeah, it's a terrific question. Uh, we have several mechanisms for that, Bruni. We have, um, number one, we have employee resource groups. Um, we have a number of them uh, focused on uh, different aspects of people's lives. We have parenting groups, we have multi-generational groups, we have a women's group, we have um, different multicultural groups. They are very one very important conduit for um, elevating the voices of our employees and our people to management. Uh, our management teams engage regularly with our employee resource groups. Um, uh, they get together through different forums. So I think um, that's one very important way. The second is through the diversity and inclusion team itself. And so um, uh, another way to get to management um, is through that. But, but our management team um, are very uh, direct and connected to people. We have, um, we have a direct chat to our CEO. It's called Ask Bill. Bill Hornbuckle is the CEO of MGM Resorts. Uh, and, and people can um, send him a message directly um, and he does respond. And so, um, and other members of our senior leadership team uh, operate in the same way. Every organization is different and has different channels, but I think it is vital for organizations to have a mechanism for leaders and managers to be able to hear the voices and views and opinions of our people. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from David Stevenson. Does the implementation of your strategy allow for affirmative action to achieve the diversity goals? Yeah, so we, we are an equal um, uh, opportunity employer. Um, we have a number of policies uh, and practices in place. We do not set quotas and targets. Um, we believe in selecting the best qualified candidates for the role. Um, we do support uh, broad policies. Um, but what's interesting about MGM is it's probably the organization that I've worked at that is the most diverse. 72% um, of our workforce is actually diverse. 
we have um, probably about 44% um, of people in our management ranks that are diverse. We've got very strong gender representation as well. So I think it depends on the company that you're in. I think it depends on the sector and the industry that you're in, um, uh, whether it's public sector, whether it's private sector, uh, you tend to see more affirmative action policies and practices um, uh, in place um, in public sector institutions uh, more than in private sector institutions, just simply because um, uh, of, of the nature of skills and requirements for certain types of specialized jobs and roles. Uh, so it varies, I think, um, organization to organization. Thank you. Uh, I have a question in from Lars Trunin. Hi, Lars. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Do you have any suggestions for improving DNI and hiring talent? For example, our organization recently discovered that to improve gender balance for more technical roles, it's valuable to change environments where you source your initial candidates from. For instance, uh, stack overflow to dedicated communities. Do you have any other tips? Yeah, it's a great question, Lars, and thanks for asking it. Um, I do think that, um, it's, it's good recruiting and acquisition practices to widen your sourcing pools. Um, so if you're looking for uh, specialized skill sets, um, uh, widen the pools through which you're sourcing. Um, there are, there's been a, a surge of boutique firms um, that have risen in the last several years that specialize in um, uh, the, 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 the sourcing of diverse talent across a variety of areas, whether that's technology fields or others. Um, but I am a big advocate for um, recruiting um, in, different, in different ways. If you're doing, for example, campus recruiting or college recruiting, um, either at the undergraduate or graduate level, uh, one of the things um, we've expanded to, for example, is actively recruiting at historically black colleges and universities in the US. So instead of going to the traditional stable of schools for undergraduate and graduate level, going to some of the some of the smaller colleges and universities that are more diverse, as an example, um, is, 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 is another thing that we're doing. So there's different ways of doing this. Um, uh, instituting referral programs from your existing employees is another way of widening your acquisition uh, capabilities. So those would be two or three things to maybe think about. What strategies is MGM putting in place to assist diverse individuals with career advancement or progression? So along the similar lines, really. Yeah, so um, we're doing several things. I'll call one out in particular, and that is um, we just launched last year a brand new leadership development program for high potential talent at the executive director and vice president level. Uh, we curated a cohort of over 50 colleagues. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the, the fact that the group is 40% um, female and probably about 38% diverse. Um, this is sort of the, the top talent team, the next generation of leaders that we're committed to and investing in. It's a one year uh, a high potential program. It includes leadership summits. It includes psychometric assessment. It includes a one-on-one -on -one pairing with a sponsor as part of the program. And so that's a very specific example of a program that we conceived, created, designed, rolled out um, that uh, has a very high emphasis on diversity and is intended to really curate the next generation of leadership for us at the company. Um, lovely, thank you. We are going back to some of the ones that came in. How do you collect the data while maintaining privacy needs and GDPR requirements? So, yeah, terrific, yeah, terrific question. Um, uh, the headline I would <coughs> give to, to you all is um, what are your forms of uh, data capture and re recording and reporting absolutely has to um, align with and um, uh, be adherent to your local laws and regulations, first and foremost, and they vary country by country. 
And so you must understand the jurisdiction in which you're operating and look at the labor and employment um, laws and policies and practices and make sure that you are falling within those guidelines. And so, uh, for example, in the US, we follow the um, Equal Employment Opportunity Guidelines established by the EEOC Commission. So when we track and report on race, we follow the racial classifications that were established by the EEOC. So African-American, um, Asian, Native American, et cetera. In the UK, you have very different uh, guidelines and classifications that follow UK laws. So it's really important to adhere to the local policies. Um, uh, and then second, secondly, um, depending on the industry and sector in which you're in, there may be another overlay of regulations. So I fall into the gaming and hotel industry. So we have guidelines around that. If you're in banking and financial services, for example, uh, there was recent legislation um, as part of the Dodd-Frank Act under Section 342 that called for voluntary diversity and inclusion, inclusion self-assessments by the big banks. So every industry and sector may have its own overlay. So it's important to understand that and then come up with a measurement framework and a measurement model that allows you to report in accordance with that. And, and the last point I'll make is it's really important that you have um, uh, a lot of close work done with both your management team as well as your internal uh, legal and compliance department. So before you put anything in the public domain, make sure you clear it with your management teams in addition to your legal and compliance departments. Thank you. There is a, a sort of second part to that question. What's the most common type of resistance to these efforts? And what are the most effective ways to overcome the resistance? Yeah, resistance can take many forms. Sometimes it can be overt resistance. Sometimes it can be um, not so overt resistance. Um, um, resistance can take the form of objections. Um, uh, we saw in the case of Google a couple of years ago where an employee actually published a manifesto objecting to internal diversity and inclusion practices that, and training that, the, that Google was uh, putting out into, into play. And it um, ended up going viral. So um, resistance takes many forms. What I advocate is uh, really promoting an environment and curating um, um, around this work um, an atmosphere and a culture of tolerance, respect, understanding. I think it's important to listen uh, to all different points of view. You may not agree, but it is important to hear and listen and understand the different viewpoints and perspectives that people may be coming from, and then to deal with um, how you want to respond in an appropriate way. Uh, but it starts with active listening, um, and that's, that's what I would advocate for. Um, going back to one of the previous questions, which sort of speaks to the, all the different groups, I guess, that, you, that you've created. Um, Jotty, could you inspire us with examples of community engagement fostered by MGM? Yes, um, there, 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 are, there are many examples. In fact, on Wednesday, um, I will be with our CEO and we're going to a, we've, we've done some work with the city of Las Vegas. Um, we're, we're actually going to be going to a park. Uh, we'll be safely distanced with about 10 volunteers and we're gonna be doing a dedication to our fallen colleagues um, who were impacted by COVID-19 and to the community at large. We're going to be doing a tree planting and um, um, putting um, in place a bench where people can go and reflect. Um, that's one example of community engagement, but specifically as it relates to diversity and inclusion, um, we have partnerships with many organizations around the country and in the local markets in which we operate. Um, some of these um, are for um, uh, supporting the community, some of them are philanthropy related, um, some of them are for specific programs, for example, the hiring, recruitment and training of veterans. Um, um, we have um, um, 
efforts with many, many organizations. Um, I, won't, I won't single out any because we work with African-American, Hispanic, female um, disability, disability groups, uh, LGBTQ+. Um, but each one of our partnerships um, is, is viewed through the lens of um, holistically, how can we engage with them? How can we have an impact on local communities? How can we create jobs? How can we provide skills-based training, vocational training to support employment in local markets uh, uh, in which we operate in the jurisdictions in which we're in? And so um, the way in which we work with these community-based partnerships varies. So sometimes it's recruitment, sometimes it's talent development, uh, sometimes it's uh, philanthropic in orientation, sometimes it's donations. Uh, and sometimes it's just funding. Um, we have scholarship programs, um, so we, it covers a range. Great, thank you. Gosh, you're very busy. <laughs> a lot on. So we haven't had any more questions in, but we have a lovely comment here from Sir Michael Dixon. Aww. Thank you, Jyoti. A fascinating insight into MGM's work in this area and your perceptive insights. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to our alumni and sharing so openly. I do hope we have the opportunity to meet before too long and I'm sure we can make that happen. So. Oh, thank you so much, Sir Dixon. It's an honor and I look forward to visiting and staying at Green Templeton College, hopefully in the not too distant future. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Well, I don't, I think we've had a huge number of questions. So you've obviously absolutely fired everyone's imagination with this talk it's been wonderful and thank you so much for giving up your time particularly it's at the crack of dawn oh, i couldn't do it <laughs> so i feel it's like we have to let you go back to bed now or something oh, it's, thank it's, you. A, it's a pleasure and if, if, if i could just say one closing comment what i would say is uh, to each of you i hope you'll have the opportunity to really reflect and think about how can you become a diversity and inclusion advocate and promote greater tolerance, understanding, and equality um, in your in your respective areas, and uh, as you go off into the world and engage with the world. And so, um, please stay in touch. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you to everybody who's attended today. It's been wonderful to have so many questions coming in as well, and a, a lovely diverse audience. Um, do remember that we have three more lectures this term as part of our alumni lecture series. Um, you'll be receiving details. We're, we're sending out our latest update on Friday and that will give you registration details for our next event. But in the meantime, stay safe, stay well and keep in touch and, and thank you so much.